Okay, so we should probably get started. So welcome back everybody to the um, final session of the first Geoschem Europe meeting. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. So if you're not presenting, um, it's probably best to switch off your video and mute your sound. Um, if you find that your sound or mic isn't working, usual sort of things of play with the settings, change your headset, and ultimately restart the computer. But we've been through everybody and we've checked the technology, so we think those are working. If we end up with some unreliability from the speaker's internet, then we may have to rejig things on the fly. On the fly. Um, and so we may move speakers to be later on if that happens. And if all of Zoom goes down and the world collapses around us, um, we may need to sort things out later on. But so far, we've been kind of good with things. Um, Uh, during the presentations, if you want to ask a question, there's a question and answer button at the bottom of the screen for attendees. Um, if you're a presenter and you'd like to ask a question, then put it through the chat. Um, we would really welcome people asking questions. Um, the point of this is for people to engage and to talk to the presenters. And so the more people who ask questions, the better, um, especially from younger uh, emerging career scientists, this is a good opportunity to ask the questions and um, it's a bit less intimidating um, on this virtual platform than it would be in person. Um, so we were running these 20 minutes for networking and um, those have not been successful, people have not engaged with those and we've had some bored presenters sat in rooms by themselves um, after this. So we're going to cancel it for this session. Um, if you uh, want to talk to the speakers, um, email them and sort out a time. I'm sure they'd be happy to chat to you about their, their research. Um, and so if that's something that you want to do, email them and set up a time to chat to them um, offline. Um, but I said the best way of doing things is to ask a question um, during their presentation. Um, so we're going to start the posters at a quarter to four, so at 15.45. Um, so we're going to go with those a little bit earlier um, than we were planning on. Um, and one of the things that we will be doing is emailing you all a feedback form um, so you can give feedback on the meeting. That should come out at some point this afternoon. Um, it would be really useful if you guys would be would fill in the form and let, you know, let us know what you think about the format. It's the first time that we've done, tried to do something like this um, as in a remote meeting. And it's the first time that we've had a European Geoscan meeting. Um, so there's probably a lot we can learn about the format and the frequency of the meeting. So if you would let us know um, through that feedback form, um, that would be great. Um, straight after the, these talks, after this session, we'll go into the poster session. Um, and you should have all been sent emails with the links for you to use to be able to go and um, go into each one of the individual poster sessions. Um, a reminder that the webinars are being recorded. The recorded material will be made available through the Geoschem YouTube page and on the web. Um, and hope you guys all enjoy the, the sessions. Um, we've got a great first keynote talk coming up from Anya Schmidt. And I think without any ado, we'll move over to Anya. OK, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Right. Um, okay. Can I go back? Sorry. Right. Okay. So thanks very much. Um, first of all, to the organizers of this really interesting meeting and for giving me an opportunity uh, to present some of the work we are doing in my research group. So I will be talking about radiative forcing from small magnitude eruptions. And I will explain as I go along what I mean by small magnitude eruptions. But if I learned one thing from Matt Evans uh, during my time at Leeds, then is always ask yourself, why do we care about things? So I wanna try to tell you why I care about volcanic eruptions. Um, in terms of climate forcing, they are a key natural driver of climate variability. So if you want to understand man-made climate change, then it's quite important that we understand and are able to quantify the impact of 
volcanic eruptions on climate as well. And just to give you some background, uh, volcanoes emit a cocktail of chemicals and the most important one for climate is sulfur dioxide or SO2. It gets converted to sulfate aerosol once it's in the atmosphere. And people like Hubert Lamm, who's shown on the picture here on the right, um, have used observations together with the occurrence of volcanic eruptions to establish a, a link between surface cooling and the occurrence of volcanic eruptions. And I show you here in this figure, you can see um, volcanic, that volcanic eruptions clearly cause a decrease in surface temperatures um, after they occurred. And just to give you some context, the, on average, the global mean surface cooling is about 0.3 degrees C. But of course, it depends on the amount of SO2 emitted and also um, there are regional differences. I think it's also fair to say that in the last four to five decades, we learned a lot of our understanding of the climate forcing mechanisms really increased and these mechanisms are fairly well understood. So we know that sulfate aerosol scatters incoming solar radiation and for volcanic eruption, this is then expressed as a a negative shortwave forcing, which is shown here in the blue line in this figure on this slide. If sulfate aerosol is in the stratosphere, then it can actually also absorb terrestrial radiation, and that results in a stratospheric heating. Here in this plot, this is shown by a positive long wave forcing. But importantly, the net effect of volcanic eruptions on climate is a negative rate of forcing, and this is shown here in this black line on the figure. And this is then ultimately the cause of the surface cooling. And we also know that these changes to the energy balance of Earth can then cause further effects, which we often um, term indirect effects. So there can be effects on, for example, large scale dynamics like the monsoon systems, but also atmospheric chemistry. And if I have time, I will show you one example uh, of that. And volcanoes also, our volcanic emissions can also interact with low level clouds, but this is not something I'm going to talk about today. So for the purpose of this talk, I also want to point out that um, during the last three to four decades, the research focus has really been on large magnitude eruptions. And that is true in terms of the observations um, we have, but also of the model simulations that have been carried out. And what, I mean, what do I mean by large magnitude eruptions? So I mean eruptions like 1991 Mount Pinatubo, which some of you may remember, and volcanologists have a scale that is called the Volcanic Explosivity Index, or VEI. It's a logarithmic scale, very similar to an earthquake scale. Um, and Pinatubo was a VEI 6. I want to make two points here. Um, there is a large number of publications um, for this eruption. So this is an example from Web of Science. Last time I looked, there have been around 850 publications with the word Pinatubo in the title alone. But the other point I want to make, these eruptions are infrequent, so they have a low recurrence frequency. We expect one eruption every 30 to 50 years on average. Um, over the last decade then, there has been an increasing recognition of what we call small magnitude eruptions. So they are smaller in magnitude than Pinatubo, for example. And I show you here, this is a from a model simulation, and this is a snapshot of June 2011, where you can see three eruptions that influence strongly the volcanic aerosol column burden. So these eruptions are smaller in magnitude. Um, and another key point here is that they have a higher occurrence frequency. So statistically, we expect one to two eruptions per year on average. And I will come back to that later in my talk. But the point is, this allows us then to, you know, we have more opportunity to gather observations, for example, and these eruptions are, I think, also great opportunities to test the skill of our models um, to simulate volcanic eruptions. But there are fewer um, publications, at least um, in terms of the uh, volcano climate modeling community. So speaking of climate models, I thought it's also useful to tell you a little bit of how volcanic eruptions are simulated in climate models. So this is, let's start with CMIP-5. Um, the most important thing here is that all CMIP-5 models prescribed stratospheric aerosol optical depth values to simulate volcanic eruptions. Okay, so they don't run with SO2 emissions, for example. And this is just one example of a CMIP-5 study. I could have shown many others, but I chose to show this one because it's quite, um, it's a good example. 
This is a study by Kleckler et al. and they looked at global ocean heat content changes following large magnitude eruptions. So these eruptions are indicated by these black triangles and these are only big ones like Pinatubo, for example. And you can see these eruption caused a drop uh, uh, in global ocean heat content um, and this is something we expect. But after the year 2000, all these simulations in CMIP-5 assumed that there have been no volcanic eruptions. So they prescribed stratospheric aerosol optical depth values that are representative of volcanically quiescent periods. I will show you in a second that, we, that there has been a series of small magnitude eruptions. And, and the question, this is really, this kind of plot motivated me to look into this. Do we need to include these smaller magnitude eruptions in model simulations? So, I think there are two key changes um, over the last decade that enabled, that enabled us to take a slightly different approach. One of them is that volcanic eruptions are increasingly well characterized. And by that, I really mean we have better information on their occurrence, but also we have better information on the amount of SO2 that is emitted by these eruptions. And this is mainly due to satellite observations, which started in the year 1979. And then there's something to be said about capabilities of climate models. So these capabilities change over time and increasingly there are more and more models that actually rely on volcanic SO2 emission data sets as opposed to prescribing aerosol optical depths. And there are several SO2 emission data sets available now and I will talk you through one, the one I'm using for this study um, here. So I show you here a time series of volcanic eruptions that emitted SO2 um, that was detected by, by satellite instruments. And this starts in 1979 and goes through to, nine, to 2015. Sorry. And the eruptions are shown as a function of latitude. And the size of each of these circles uh, represents the magnitude of an eruption. So the larger um, the circle, the larger the magnitude. You see here Pinatubo in 1991 was a VI6 eruption and the color refers to the mass of SO2 emitted. So now let me talk you through this in a little bit more detail. So the early 1980s saw a large magnitude eruption that of El Chichon, which emitted six teragrams of SO2 high into the stratosphere. Then we had Pinatubo in 1991, and this was the last VI6 eruption to date, and it emitted between 10 and 20 teragrams, again, very high into the stratosphere. And then we have the post Pinatubo period, um, and this is quite interesting um, because you can see already there are very few eruptions in that in the period, and the few eruptions you have emitted actually very little um, SO2. So I call this a volcanically quiescent period. And then we have this post 2005 period where we have a high frequency of uh, small magnitude eruptions. So these are these are eruptions VI three to five. And what I want to point out here, for the majority of these eruptions, the SO2 was emitted into the upper troposphere and lower stratosphere. And this was one of the reasons why people said we can ignore these eruptions. They emit, in relative terms, they emit less than eruptions like Pinatubo, and they emitted only into the lower stratosphere, where the lifetime of the sulfate aerosol is much shorter than for Pinatubo. Um, so just as a reminder, in CMIP-5, these, ma these small magnitude eruptions were neglected altogether over this time period shown here in this blue box. But also for CMIP-6, uh, the majority of models will actually again prescribe aerosol optical properties. And I want to now show you a different approach where we use emissions. So I'm showing you results here from using CSM WACAM, which has an interactive sulfur chemistry scheme and it has a prognostic stratospheric aerosol scheme. And I use this with the SO2 emission data set um, that I've just shown to you. Um, and I want to address three main questions. So the, the first one is what is the impact of these small magnitude eruptions on the stratosphere? And what is the impact on radiation, really? I was also always very curious from a volcanology point of view um, in terms of how frequent are these small magnitude eruptions. Is this period 2005 to 2015 unusual or not? I should probably, I forgot to say that in the few papers that are out there, they often deal with the hiatus um, and they describe this period 2005 to 2015 as unusual. Um, so I wanted to understand whether this is really the case or not. And lastly, I want to 
look at whether we need to include these eruptions in climate model projections of future surface temperature changes. And again, my motivation came from CMIP-5, where volcanic eruptions were ignored when it came to sur uh, future uh, surface temperature projections, for example. So I will now talk you through some of the key results. Uh, so to answer the first question, I, I want to convince you here that um, these small magnitude eruptions are indeed key and they, because they increase the stratospheric aerosol optical depths quite significantly. So let's look at this in more detail. I show you here the global mean stratospheric aerosol optical depths at 550 nanometers. The dashed line is a model simulation without volcanic SO2 emissions. And then the solid black line is a model simulation with the volcanic uh, SO2 emissions in. And you can see eruptions like Pinatubo cause the greatest increase in stratospheric aerosol optical depths. Again, this is expected. It had the largest emission of SO2. But look at this post-2005 period. You can see the sustained increase in stratospheric aerosol optical depths. So this is on the log scale. Of course, the magnitudes are different, but it's really about the sustained increase here. I now also overplotted this blue line. Uh, so this is the data set, the aerosol optical depths data set that is going to be used uh, by most CMIP-6 models. Um, this is mainly based on satellite observations. And overall, the model is doing really a, a reasonable good job representing these observations. And there's, of course, also uncertainty on these observations. There are some differences, for example, this post pinatubo recovery period. And I think these differences are real and it's worth investigating but I, I won't go into the detail here. Overall, I'm happy with the mean stratospheric aerosol optical depth changes that the model is producing using this very different approach. So we can also then calculate based on these model simulations that small magnitude eruption contribute on average around 50% to the total stratospheric aerosol optic, optical depths in the absence of large magnitude eruptions. In other words, if, if you want to, if you're interested in your model in getting the stratospheric aerosol properties right or an SAOD right, then you want to include um, these small magnitude eruptions. You can't just ignore them. Now then, do these matter for climate? Um, that's really the next question that I wanted to address. And I, in the model, I can diagnose the effective rate of forcing, so I can also account for rapid adjustments, for example. And I do this for model simulations with and without volcanic eruptions. And I show you here the global three months mean volcanic forcing over time. And if you please concentrate on the black line, which is the net forcing, you can see the peak forcing of about minus three watts per square meter occurs for the, after the Mount Pinatubo eruption. And if we look at the time mean forcing um, over the period 1999 to 2002, we get a very small forcing in the model as expected because we have very few volcanic eruptions. If we look at the time mean over this period where we had a high frequency of volcanic eruptions, uh, we get a forcing of minus 0.12 watts per square meter. And just to mention that this, is in very, this value is in very good agreement with IPCC AR5, uh, which made an estimate of this forcing based on stratospheric aerosol optical depth measurements. Um, and I think it's also worth comparing the change in forcing over these two time periods, um, which is minus 0.08 watts per square meter. And I think it's useful to look at that because it can be compared to the change in CO2 forcing over the same two time periods, which is 0, uh, 0.25 watts per square meter, a positive forcing. So in other words, these volcanoes offset around 30% of the CO2 forcing over that time period. And again, I want to try to convince you that this is another argument that it really matters whether or not you include um, these eruptions in your climate model simulations. So now, as I said earlier, I was interested in understanding how frequent um, these eruptions are. And I admit right away, my data set is short, so it only starts in 1979. It's therefore limited, but it's the best uh, I have uh, available at the moment. So, and I, I thought I look at it anyway. And um, what I did is I defined small magnitude eruptions as eruptions that had a column height greater than 10 kilometers. Um, so I want them to reach the upper troposphere and lower stratosphere and that emit SO2 greater or equal to 0.01 teragrams of SO2. And if I look at this data set, what I find is that actually the occurrence, but also the non-occurrence of volcanic eruptions 
is very well represented by a Poisson distribution. So the chance of having no small magnitude eruption based on this data set and based on these statistics in any given year is only 16%, whereas the chance of having one or two small magnitude eruptions per year is 57%. And I conclude here that it really these volcanically quiescent periods, as we've seen it post Pinatubo, are statistically rare. And I would argue, based on statistics, this, this 2005 to 2015 period with frequent small magnitude eruptions is not unusual. And this is just a slight change in emphasis how we describe these periods and how we think about volcanic eruptions and, and their role in, for example, forcing climate. So lastly, I want to now look at what is the con long-term contribution of these small magnitude eruptions to Earth's surface energy balance. So what I did is um, I used this volcanic forcing time series that I've shown you that I've calculated in CSM. And I, I, I assigned <coughs> recurrence probabilities for both eruptions of different magnitudes and also for these volcanically quiescent periods. And I, I used these Poisson distributions to do that. And then I used Monte Carlo sampling to basically generate millions of these forcing time series. And I feed these millions of forcing time series in, into a simple climate model. So this model uh, is called FAIR and it's heavily used by IPCC AR6. And this allows me to calculate surface temperature changes. So let me talk you through some of this, these results. Uh, first, let me explain the figures because we will look at a couple of these. So on the left hand side, you see the rated forcing that are basically used in, in the model. Um, and you can see in this case, I used the forcing as, calcul as calculated in CSM between 1990 and 2015. And in the first scenario, I assume there's no volcanic forcing after the year 2015. So that's very much a CMAP5 approach, okay? And then on the right-hand side, you see the model simulated um, temperature anomaly, and you can clearly see, it, as we expect, um, temperatures um, go up over time, um, simply because of the, the increase in greenhouse gas emissions. So the first exercise I did is I thought, okay, I'm trying to simulate what would be, what is going to be done or what is done in CMIP6 scenario MIP in terms of future volcanic forcing. So what they do is they use a time mean stratospheric aerosol optical depths uh, between 1850 and 2014, um, which is around 0.01. And you can scale this in, in IPC methodology, you can scale this by a factor to derive a forcing. And that's what I did. And you're supposed to ramp it up for the first 10 years, and then you have a constant forcing as shown here by this orange line, okay? And if I then, if you look at the difference uh, between the red line here, this was the simulation without a volcanic forcing, and this orange line, the long-term mean temperature difference is minus 0.08 Kelvin. So now I wanted to understand how much of this difference can be explained by small magnitude eruptions only. Okay, so I generate millions of my forcing time series, run these through the model. The blue line here is a mean of all these forcing time series, just easier for you to see. Um, and then this blue line here is then the uh, predicted temperature anomaly. And again, you can look at the difference between the red line and the blue line, which is minus 0.05 Kelvin. So this means actually that there's a very large or there's a large contribution from small magnitude eruptions to this long-term global mean surface energy budget. Um, to give you some context here, the mean rate of warming is around 0.015 to 0.02 degrees C per year. Um, and you can see that these numbers are indeed significant. So lastly, um, this is my um, last slide before I conclude. I just want to say it took a couple of years. I spent a couple of summers at NCAR to help with the MEM model development. I just want to motivate people that it's really useful to spend time and effort developing models and new capabilities because they allow discoveries, really. So this is work led by Susan Solomon, and we looked at recovery timescales uh, of polar ozone. And we run a simulation with and without volcanic eruptions. And it turns out that these small magnitude eruptions, some of them at least, actually significantly can, can significantly affect polar ozone. And this is shown in this plot. So you see here changes in, in percentage changes in ozone. And if you look at the right hand side of the plot, 
This is the Kalbuko eruption, uh, which was a small magnitude eruption. And in the model, including this eruption, resulted in an ozone hole that's about 4 million square kilometers larger than without the eruption. So again, that's an indication that we need to include these eruptions, not only for climate simulations, but also for chemistry. And I want to conclude now. So more and more models uh, have capabilities to include volcanic sulfur dioxide emission inventories, and many models um, actually have very good skill simulating stratospheric sulfur budgets, for example. Um, and I just want to say I, I'm very happy to share the volcanic emission data set if anyone from the GeoSchem uh, community is eager to, to include that data set. I would be very happy to talk to you about that. And we are always happy to compare to observation. So thank you very much. And I take questions. Thank you very much, um, Anya. So the first question I'm going to ask is, you've spoken quite a lot about the radiative impacts of volcanoes. Um, are there other impacts that we should care about? So I was thinking about more sort of impacts on the composition of the troposphere or other, other kind of things. Would you like to just tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so definitely, I mean, the, the, here I focus really on volcanic eruptions that mainly affect the stratosphere. Um, but you've seen these smaller magnitude eruptions can definitely affect ozone. Um, so depending on when they erupt and, and where the eruption is, where the eruption is taking place. Um, if we, there are also other eruptions that emit SO2 predominantly into the troposphere. So it's well known by now that they can affect um, low level clouds, for example. There's also an indication higher up in the atmosphere, they might affect cirrus clouds, the jury is still out on that. So I think overall I would say they are perfect natural lab to understand many processes, also impacts on precipitation and large scale dynamics. Um, and this an, an ever increasing set of observational capabilities. Uh, yeah, I think they are quite good examples and labs. Cool, and the next question is from Alfred Bockery. Um, what do you think the uncertainties are on your radiative forcing estimates? Yes, um, so in the, the simulation was a notched simulation. Um, if, we, if you run free running simulations, I would think, uh, as I said, most radi radiation schemes and models are pretty de decent in terms of simulating volcanic eruptions and the climatic impacts. But I would think um, together with uncertainties on SO2 emissions, so the input in, in first place, uncertainties are on the order of 20 to 30 uh, percent, depending on the eruption type and the, the specific situation. And then my next question is, these seem like quite good experiments for testing geoengineering approaches where you put a, put a load of sulfur into the stratosphere. What's your view about our understanding of the science that comes out of these volcano experiments for geoengineering? Yeah, so indeed, um, I mean, um, it became cl pretty clear, just to give you an example, um, doing model simulations of volcanic eruption with ever increasing SO2 emissions already in the 1980s, it was noticed that particle sizes will increase um, for ever increasing SO2 emissions. And that will lead um, to enhanced coagulation and larger particle sizes that fall out very quickly out of the stratosphere. So um, there's a lim the impact of volcanic eruptions and also geoengineering is limited. And I think the geoengineering community can learn a lot uh, from looking at the volcanic eruption literature and the observations. So again, they serve as a real world example and opportunity to, to test some of our understanding when it comes to geoengineering. But there's also a key difference. Often we talk about continuous emissions for, for geoengineering, whereas volcan volcanoes are sporadic emissions. So a lot to think about. Cool, and a final question from Danielle. How do you model the vertical distribution of emissions and the fraction injected into the stratosphere? Um, is this just from the categorical VEI index and what are the uncertainties for small eruptions? Yeah, so for small eruptions, um, in particular, there are some, for example, this June 2019 Rey Koke eruption, this really just straddled the upper troposphere and lower stratosphere. So there is uncertainty on the exact split between the amount that went into the stratosphere and into the upper troposphere. Um, we use satellite observations, for example, IASI. Uh, with IASI, you can estimate the height of, of the SO2. Again, there's uncertainty on that. And then we put it in the model at that level. Um, 
And obviously you can run sensitivity simulations to try to understand how um, uncertainty in the emission profile fe uh, feeds through to uncertainty in your way to the forcing. That's great. We should move on to the next talk. So thank you very much, Amia, for a very interesting presentation. Um, and the next court talk is coming from Irina Thaler. Yes, hello. <laughs> Hi. Um, one second. Can I go back with the slide? <clears throat> Okay, sorry. Okay, welcome everybody. I'm Irina Tala. I'm a postdoc at Hebrew University, and I'm going to talk about ongoing work with Professor Nir Shavid, Professor Henrik Svensmark, Martin Enghoff, and Jakob Svensmark. Um, this is about aerosol growth through iron mass flux. What do I need, mean by that? Um, so we are interested in the effect ionized molecular clusters could have when they condense on existing aerosols. Um, so it has been known that, so half, around half of the existing aerosols are thought to come from secondary particles, which means um, condensable va vaporous nucleate. And this nucleation is now known that it is influenced by ionization. Um, atmospheric ionization in not only in a sulfur sulfuric acid water only system, but also if ammonia and amines are present. And it's also um, thought to be important for biogenic nucleation of particles. Um, what, what, I will going, what I will talk about now is the enhanced ion mass flux on existing aerosols. So we are interested in the growth of existing aerosol particles and how this changes with the ionization state of the atmosphere. <clears throat> okay, um, this is all based on experimental data which has been published in Nature Communications in 2017 by Svensmark et al. Um, there they had a stainless um, reaction chamber with sulfuric acid produced in it by ozone and SO2 and UV light, which led through photolysis of ozone to SO2 production. And then they could um, modify the ionization state of the, in the atmospheric chamber by a gamma source. And then they analyzed the nucleating and growing aerosols and how this changed in different um, atmospheric conditions. And what they found is that the growth time it takes for the aerosols is um, different um, depending on the atmospheric ionization state. And um, so they found that the aerosols grow faster in the presence of higher ionization. Um, so this is a sulfuric acid only system, but we do think that in the atmosphere something similar could happen as well. So, um, okay. So due to the enhanced ionization, um, there is an enhanced interaction between the ionized molecular clusters and the existing aerosols. And this enhanced interaction can then um, lead to an enhanced recombination due to the column forces and they did uh, theoretically described that in the in the paper and we wanted to know if this enhanced molecular cluster condensation then um, has an effect on the size distribution of existing aerosols um, now in the real atmosphere maybe sulfuric acid is not abundant enough for this effect to be important for sulfuric acid, but we know that there are all kinds of other species in complex cluster ions, which um, will be created after galactic cosmic rays first um, produce the primary charged species, species and then ion molecule interactions will then lead to these complex cluster ions. And um, 
like a measurement from Arnold 2008 showed that the most abundant negative uh, cluster ions are involving sulfuric acid clusters and um, ammonia clusters, so, uh, nitric, nitric acid clusters, and the most common positive um, clusters are acetonitril and in acetone. So we do not specify in our work which kind of um, ionized molecule uh, clusters are present. We just include their interactions and condensation um, then in the geoscam and see how it affects growth. And then the question we are really interested in is if it leads to a change of CCNs over the solar cycle when we take this ion mass flux into account. Okay, so the assumptions is that we have available charged molecular clusters at the primary ion density, and the discharged clusters have a, a mass of 300 AMU. Um, as galactic cosmic rays enter the atmosphere, um, they have to have a minimum momentum to overcome the Earth's magnetic field. And so this depends, of course, on the latitude and longitude and is modulated also by the solar magnetic field. So in GeoSCAM, it's already prescribed. Um, there is already pre uh, prescribed some um, calculations based on Ososkin and Kowalczow 2006, um, who calculated the ionization rates in the atmosphere. And we just use these prescribed schemes and um, then run, um, do runs for the solar minimum and then for the solar maximum, and depending on the different ionization scheme. And then we one time have this um, enhanced condensation of the ion molecular cluster switched on and one switched off. And this implementation is based on the theoretical description of um, Svensson of 2017. Okay, and then we also use two different ionization schemes, the binary ion nucleation scheme from U2010, which is um, based on a kinetic model um, in the sulfuric, ion, sulfuric acid water system and the unorganic nucleation scheme of Dan, Dan et al. 2016, um, which includes um, sulfuric acid the sulfuric acid water system ionized and neutral, as well as the ammonia sulfuric acid and water system ionized and neutral. Okay, so now to the results. Um, here you can see the difference um, of the CN between solar maximum and solar minimum as a function of time for different sizes of the particles, so CN3 refers to particles larger than three nanometers and CN50 to particles larger than 50 nanometers. And this is averaged over um, zero to 13 kilometers. <clears throat> and for the then um, 2016 unorganic nucleation scheme. And um, if we take the temporal average of the data available, we do find that including this enhanced nucleation and enhanced condensation due to the ion clusters, um, we, we do find a change of CN50 of around 0.4% um, compared to the effect which is only due to the ion nucleation scheme of DUN, um, which has an effect of 0.2%. So basically our effect enhances um, the solar minimum, solar maximum effect by a factor of two uh, for a height of zero to 13 kilometers. And more or less, it's the same for uh, the average height between zero and three kilometers. Now, when you look at the different- You've got 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> so the U nucleation, it looks similar. And um, basically, um, this effect, like this, it's too small to be climate relevant, but we have lots of uncertainties, like what, 
by scavenging the primary emission uncertainties, the nucleation rate uncertainties. And so it could be that it's climate relevant taking the uncertainties we have given in the models. Thank you. That's great, thank you very much. Um, so my question is, you didn't tell us which of the um, model microphysics schemes were you using? Um, I was using the Mo Thomas module and the baseline emission scenarios. And what do you think would, do you think that your conclusions would be different if you used a different microphysics scheme or is it um, essentially um, that there is no sensitivity to the microphysics? Um, I think the uncertainties are quite large. I didn't show any runs where we um, use different emission scenarios, but I did some tests on it and it can um, modify the effect by an order of magnitude. <laughs> um, so this is one thing and then um, the nucleation schemes also influence the effect. Cool, that's great. Thank you very much. So the next talk is from Paolo Tokela from the University of L'Aquila. And you'll need to unmute because we can't hear you. Mm. It's not you working. Can just re request control. Ah, okay. Oh. Oh. Okay. Okay, thank you. I am Paolo Tuccella, researcher at University of L'Aquila, and uh, in this presentation uh, I'll talk about the climatic effect by radiation absorbing aerosols in atmosphere and uh, snow. Here in the, this figure we see uh, the radiating forcing of uh, greenhouse gases and uh, aerosol particles estimated by IPCC. Aerosol particles are very important for uh, climatic system because they are partially compensated uh, the warming used by uh, greenhouse gases. But uh, the magnitude of their effect is very uh, uncertain. Uh, aerosol particles uh, can interact directly with uh, the solar and infrared uh, radiation. When uh, the aerosol load increases in the atmosphere, the atmosphere uh, cool. If, uh, uh, but if we look at the, same, uh, at the second figure, uh, we can see the radiating forcing calculated by, uh, by IPCC, species by uh, species. And uh, some uh, uh, aerosol like uh, black carbon absorb the radiation and have a radiative uh, forcing, uh, positive radiating forcing. According uh, to IPCC, organic aerosols produce a cooling effect, but we know that a fraction of organic carbon called uh, brown carbon is radiation absorbing, but uh, this effect is uh, missed in the most part of uh, atmospheric models. And also the dust is uh, uh, radiation absorbing aerosols, is radiative forcing is in average uh, negative, but there is a probability that uh, the, uh, the forcing may be uh, positive. Finally, when uh, the absorbing aerosols are deposited on the snow, they lower the snow albedo, and this results in a positive uh, forcing. 
and uh, in the last IPCC report, uh, only uh, black carbon is, take, is uh, taken into account for this effect, and the contribution of brown carbon and dust is missed, is not uh, calculated. The aim of uh, this work is to study Uh, the uh, sensitivity of black carbon absorption to the aerosol mixing states and brown carbon uh, presence. And finally, we have also evaluated the climatic effect by radiation absorbing aerosols in uh, the snow. We have simulated uh, the radiation absorbing aerosols mass uh, concentration with the GeoSchem uh, model and uh, uh, including the most recent observational uh, constraint for black carbon, brown carbon, and uh, dust. And uh, the aerosol optical properties has been calculated uh, with uh, the Flex AUD post processing tool, uh, that is a post processing in, uh, um, is offline to GeoSchem. And finally, the radiative forcing has been calculated with a radiative transfer model. Here, uh, we compare the absorbing optical depth for uh, black carbon with uh, Ironet station. We test the sensitivity of three uh, mixing assumptions. The first is uh, an external mixing without and uh, with brown carbon. The second one is a full internal mixing with and without brown carbon. And the last is a partial internal mixing, again, including and not including the uh, brown carbon. And uh, uh, how we can see in uh, this uh, scatter plot, Uh, the calculated ab absorbing optical depth improve by increasing the complexity, the complexity of, uh, uh, of uh, optical calculation and including the uh, brown carbon, the best simulation is uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is the simulation done with the partial internal mixing at including uh, the brown carbon in the mixture. And here we see the implication for the direct uh, radiating forcing. The radiating forcing of black carbon is 0.13 and 0.525 uh, watt for square meter for external and internal mixing assumption respectively. And Andy, uh, uh, the brown carbon, in the case of internal mixing, the radiative forcing associated to black carbon and brown carbon mixture increased to 0.40 watt for square meters. And previous works have suggested that the inclusion of black carbon, of brown carbon, could fill the gap between the models and observational constraint model in, uh, in the calculation of black carbon. In our results, the increase of radiating forcing uh, or due to uh, brown carbon is, the, is reduced by about a factor two because we have, include, uh, we have included in our simulation the blanching effect of brown carbon from uh, biomass burning. The, co the, the content of uh, radiation absorbing aerosol is no, is, uh, uh, is calculated starting from the deposition field uh, taken from uh, GeoSchem output and uh, precipitation rate from uh, reanalysis. And uh, in the scatter plot, we compare uh, the results with worldwide uh, observation and uh, our model is able to reproduce the uh, seasonal, uh, um, the, the regional variation of black carbon in snow, of equivalent black carbon in snow, and uh, the non-BC absorption uh, fraction. Here uh, we show uh, the radiating forcing 
uh, associated to radiation absorbing aerosols in uh, snow. The uh, perturbation to snow albedo induced by uh, absorbing aerosols has been calculated with a parameterization of uh, uh, me uh, theory. And in general, we have found that no black carbon compound account for 40% uh, uh, of the total forcing and the anthropogenic source account for uh, about the half of uh, the total forcing. Finally, uh, we have uh, investigated the regional and uh, uh, seasonal... You've got 30 seconds. Yeah, is the last. The, the seasonal and uh, regional uh, uh, variation. In general, the black carbon dominate every way and uh, in every season, with the exception of uh, middle latitude in Asia, where the dust forcing spring uh, represent the alpha of the forcing. And uh, uh, concerning the brown carbon, the largest impact has been found during summer in uh, the Arctic. Thank you for your attention. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, so the question that I've got is, what's the balance between anthropogenic secondary organic aerosol and anthropogenic primary aerosol in driving what you see? So. Um, Okay, yeah, in uh, uh, the simulation uh, we have uh, uh, considered as anthropogenic aerosol uh, the fossil fuel, biofuel and the secondary organic aerosol from uh, aromatic compound oxidation. And what's the balance between the primary sources and then that secondary source from aromatics? The aromatics, uh, uh, maybe I remember the, no, no, I consider all uh, the, uh, the aromatics as uh, uh, anthropogenic. Okay, that's great. We should move on to the next talk, um, which is from Irma Priadigos. Um, Okay. Okay. Okay, well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Irma and uh, today I'll be talking about the relation between cosmic rays and clouds. As you know, uh, the Earth average surface temperature is increasing, but there's a lot of, uh, of uncertainty in the predictions. And one of the reasons is because uh, we do not understand well enough how aerosols and clouds work. A small piece of this puzzle has to do with cosmic rays and clouds, and that's what I'm going to talk about. But first, in case that someone doesn't know, let me remind you very quickly what cosmic rays are. Cosmic rays are high energy particles that travel through space and can have different origins. They can come from our sun, they can come from different parts of our galaxy, such as supernova, and they can also come from uh, other galaxies. They are mainly protons and they are continuously arriving to Earth where they can interact with the uh, components of the atmosphere, for example, ionizing uh, the atoms. Later, these ions are going to interact with the aerosols of the atmosphere. But as I told you before, we don't know too much about, aer about aerosols. However, uh, an experiment called CLOUD that is being run at CERN is reproducing the formation of aerosols uh, in a huge chamber, as you can see in this picture. And um, the, this experiment have reported uh, quite interesting results. One of them is that it has, uh, it, uh, it was the first experiment to demonstrate that cosmic rays can enhance the formation of aerosols into clouds and under certain circumstances. So it is suggested uh, that cosmic rays could be a possible natural climatic forcing agent since the flux of cosmic rays uh, vary with the sun activity. What does it mean? When we have a very active sun, it's able to, gener to generate a more powerful magnetic field 
that is going to shield cosmic rays coming out from uh, the solar system. So in a solar maximum situation, uh, the total cosmic radiation arriving to Earth uh, would be less than in, the, in a solar minimum situation, and then we will have uh, less clouds. Uh, the flux of cosmic rays uh, have been reported to correlate with uh, several properties of aerosols and clouds. Several mechanisms have been proposed to explain these correlations. But basically what happens here is that uh, cosmic rays uh, ionize the smallest particles of the atmosphere, then these ions uh, condensate onto aerosols. And then these charged aerosols are supposed to grow faster than the neutral ones. And when they have the appropriate size, uh, they can form new cloud condensation uh, nuclei, and then uh, we will have more clouds. So theoretically, uh, the higher the flux of cosmic rays, uh, the higher uh, the cloud cover. However, there are a lot of factors that can enhance or dampen this uh, effect. Uh, so far, I must say that uh, several studies that used to use can have reported that the growth of aerosols are insensitive to uh, the cosmic rate changes. In contrast to these results, um, a new study uh, have been recently presented, the one that Irina mentioned before, that uh, includes all of the interactions between ions and aerosols. Uh, they are nucleation, condensation, and coagulation, and I show you here in this scheme all of these interactions. So the point here is that previous studies uh, are only taking into account the effect of ions in the nucleation process. So uh, this expression I show you here uh, is an example of a parametris parametrization already included in the GeoScan model that takes into account the effect of the ions in the nucleation uh, rates. So here, N minus is, is the concentration of ions, K and P are some factors, and this is the concentration of sulfuric acid. So it is clear that if there is an increase in the um, concentration of ions, uh, then the nucleation rates also increase. On the other hand, uh, the new mechanism proposed suggests uh, including all of, uh, of these interactions. And the point here is that uh, when you are considering, for example, the condensation of ions onto aerosols, a new small mass uh, is added to the aerosol, and this can be an important uh, factor. So in this case, for example, uh, the expression for the neutral condens condensation of aerosols becomes something like this, where all of the interactions are taken into account, and we would have something similar for uh, the charge uh, particles and for the other interactions. And that's what I try to implement in the GeoScan model. To do that, uh, I'm using a 4x5 resolution with the Thomas 40 microphysics, and I'm using two different classes of simulations to take into account the solar maximum and the solar minimum situation. Here, uh, the input are the ionization rates of the atmosphere that uh, change depending on the solar activity. Below, I show you uh, the, ionis the average ionization rates uh, of the atmosphere as a function of latitude and height for a solar maximum and minimum situation. As you can see in the solar minimum, the ionization uh, rates are higher. Okay, when I try to implement all of the interactions in the model, I realized that I will have to increase by three the number of particle beams if I want to include the negative and positive uh, particles. One solution we consider uh, was to uh, only, uh, only consider a fixed fraction of charged particles per beam. So to test this idea, uh, I first consider the solar minimum situation because there I have a higher ionization rate. And uh, I am assuming an extreme situation where uh, all particles in V1 are charged and then uh, the fraction of charged particles uh, linearly decreases uh, until being 10. Below, I show you the results of the simulation. Uh, on the top, I show you the simulations without the implementation of the interactions. Sorry, on the top and, and below, I show you other uh, results with the uh, implementations. Uh, I show you the number of particles uh, with sizes larger than 10, 18 nanometers as a function of latitude and height. And it is clearly observed that there is a strong reduction on the number of particles. Also, 
if we analyze uh, the difference of the CCN between one situation to another, we see that this strong reduction is about 10 to 40%, which is huge and is not what we expected. This is because here a negative feedback, feedback is playing an important role. When we charge uh, the smallest particles, then uh, the condensation, condensation rates increase a lot and then these particles are lost before reaching CCN sizes. Uh, because uh, when the nucleation rates are higher, uh, more nano-sized particles compete for the same uh, condensable gases and uh, they grow slowly and they are lost before uh, reaching uh, CZN sizes. So, of course, this is not a realistic situation. So, my next step is to consider a more realistic situation with different charge uh, fractions before we can draw any conclusion about the relation between clouds and cosmic rays. And that's all, thank you very much. That's great, thank you very much. Um, so our first question is from Jonathan and Jonathan Mooch. Mooch, Mooch. Um, why did previous GSCAN studies with, your, with the first parameterization show so little changes and yours so, show such large changes? Is it two things cancelling out in the previous simulations? You mean that with the previous one, you obtained a small change and now I am obtaining a huge change? Yes. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. So, uh, because now I'm... Sorry. Um, I can... Yeah. Okay, so before they are only considering the effect on the nucleation process here. In my case, I'm also including uh, the effects in the rest of the of the interactions and I assume extreme case. I mean, I, I'm considering uh, a huge amount of charged particles. That's why I see this change, but it's not a real effect. Okay, um, so if we move on to the next talk, uh, this is from Jonathan Motch. Um, we all set. Might even be able to pronounce your name right. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, so I'm uh, Jonathan Mock, and I uh, am working a uh, postdoc at Harvard, working with Loretta Mickley and Daniel Jacob. And I'm going to talk today about uh, using Geoschem to look at aerosol radiation interactions, uh, specifically in China in winter. And so what you can see here in this uh, picture is just how aerosols can be very especially during extreme uh, events, extreme episodes with high aerosol concentrations can have a visibly significant impact on light and radiation in the atmosphere, which then can have a, a large impact on climate. And so as has been, oh, sorry, I forgot there's a delay. Uh, as has been discussed in one of the previous talks, um, aerosol radiation interactions, why do we care? Um, because they can affect local, uh, local meteorology and climate. Uh, this is a little cartoon here showing what can happen is you can have solar radiation uh, that can then interact with aerosols. Some of it can be reflected back to space from re uh, reflective aerosols. Other radiation can then be absorbed. Uh, radiation that's absorbed by uh, carbonaceous aerosols or dust then can uh, heat surrounding air, as well as the fact that you have aerosol radiation that's reflected away means that there's less solar radiation that reaches the surface. And so um, due to the reflection aloft as well as the absorption. And so altogether, these effects can lead to less convection because you're cooling the surface and can be heating uh, higher up. Uh, you can have less rainfall, there's cloud evaporation. Uh, this leads to more inversions. And in general, can trap pollution and then enhance surface pollution. So there can be a positive feedback where you have the aerosols modifying the climate and local meteorology to make the meteorological conditions more conducive to uh, aerosol formation and pollution buildup. So um, some previous, lots of previous studies have tried to look at aerosol radiation interactions, especially over China. Uh, some limitations of previous studies uh, are, uh, there have been studies that use um, things like wharf chem and have uh, kind of high resolution models, but then have prescribed for boundary conditions. So this here is a cartoon or a show, 
a uh, diagram showing how a wharf chem model was set up with different nested domains, but then the outer domain uses set boundary conditions. So in that type of setup, you're constraining the meteorological um, parameters and the feedbacks that you can have in the simulation because you have these boundary conditions. And as well, since you're just looking at a limited region, you won't be capturing kind of any more regional global climate effects that aerosols can have. Um, on the other hand, global models can also look at uh, aerosol radiation interactions, but lots of global climate models have pretty simplified chemistry. And so whereas uh, some of these chemistry models uh, maybe have meteorological boundary conditions, you can kind of think of the global climate models as often having uh, chemistry boundary conditions. So for example, uh, the GEOS climate model, which is uh, used to generate the MARA-2 and GSFP meteorologies, has uh, prescribed chemical fields for lots of different um, chemical precursors that make aerosols in their default go-kart model, which then means that the effect of meteorology on the chemistry is dampened because some of the chemistry is set. So what we've done here um, in this work is build on previous work by um, people like Christoph Keller and Mike Long and Lu Hu and coupling uh, GeosChem to the Geos ESM, which as I mentioned is the climate model that is used to make MARA2 and GSFP. So most of us are familiar with GeosChem as a chemical transport model. This is kind of the more familiar setup. We don't normally see this going on, um, but Geos ESM has all these different normal processes of a climate model. In GS ESM, there's a aerosol module called GoCart, which is what provides radiation, uh, provides aerosols to radiation, and then the radiation direct from the um, affected by GoCart aerosols is what affects the transport and dynamics and processes in the model. And normally, we just take the meteorological fields from that and run GSChem. Um, what we've done is implemented two-way coupling between GSChem and radiation and uh, in uh, GS ESM. So the GS chem aerosols are fed into the go kart module, which then passes them on to the radiation code, which then affects the meteorology and processes in GS, which then in turn affects the GS chem aerosols. Um, so this new setup allows us to simultaneously uh, look at the effect of aerosol radiation interactions on climate and meteorology in a way that has uh, no prescribed meteorological boundary conditions as well as no prescribed chemical boundary conditions. It's really kind of more of a free running model. So um, this is kind of some initial results from some early simulations with GSGC, which is what we call the uh, coupled GSChem GS uh, model and GC offline is the traditional GSChem everyone is more familiar with. Uh, so in the model, the way we have it set up uh, in this initial set I'm showing you, um, you can see GC offline here for this winter of 2000, uh, February to January, February 2013. GC offline does a good job capturing uh, the PM 2.5 pollution over China in this winter, whereas GOCC has a very large overestimate. Um, this has now been diagnosed as due primarily to issues with the nitrate overestimate from uh, too much too little wet deposition as well as some emissions errors and then just meteorology and regridding errors which can't be avoided um, when comparing uh, GC offline to the G GSGC. Um, good news is that the differences dampen as you look at a different winter. Um, this was one of the most polluted winters in China in recent memory um, and uh, GSGC and G uh, GSChem offline, GC offline, both capture the trend of decreasing pollution. Um, so I'm going to focus now on this winter 20, uh, this 2013 winter, including December and other figures, just to kind of get an estimate of how can we use this new tool to look at chemistry, climate uh, interact, chemistry, climate feedbacks, and aerosol radiation interactions. So um, in line with previous studies, uh, and off of that, we see that the aerosols over China during this winter of 2012, 2013, significantly decreased downwelling radiation at the surface. So be, this is here is showing the difference between a simulation where um, it's run as normal and a simulation where we zero out aerosols in the troposphere. So essentially you can think of aerosols being transparent. And so what, we sh what you get is the uh, effect of aerosols on, um, on climate and radiation in the, whoop, 
And so, yeah, there's a large decrease in radiation due to aerosols. This in turn leads to a temperature decrease. So the aerosols are reducing radiation to the surface as well as re then correspondingly reducing temperature. Um, and again, as the, in this simulation I'm showing here, the PM 2.5 is overestimated. Uh, the effect is also probably overestimated as well. So zooming in on the local effect, and this is something that is uh, looked at frequently in model studies with things like WARFCHEM, um, we see a similar local response. So as expected, uh, aerosol radiation interactions cool the surface um, and the cooling gets less pronounced with latitude. So again, what I'm showing here is the effect of aerosols on uh, these different parameters. And so you can see in over Be the Beijing area, temperature is cooled significantly at the surface by the aerosols. The temperature cooling gets less with altitude. This is due to uh, the surface heating is the primary um, thing that's cooled as well as absorbing aerosols. You've got about 30 seconds. Oh, really? Okay. I'm going to run through. Cool thing we can see is local, um, local changes as well. So the East Asian winter monsoon is weakened by, uh, geos by aerosol radiation interactions in China. And then there's a large effect, about 30% uh, of the PM 2.5 over China this winter is, a, is due to aerosol radiation interactions in the model. And so this is just kind of an interesting example of what we can find. We can look at the local and regional climate effects simultaneously. Thank you. That's great. So uh, I think the first question is from Paul Palmer, which is sort of asking about whether you've evaluated whether the model with the cloud um, aerosol interactions is better than the model without with just using the, um, the go-kart scheme. Um, so that's what I've been in the process of doing. Uh, in general, studies that have looked at go-kart versus geoschem show geoschem matches AOD and everything better. Um, more, more recent simulations which I've gotten have gotten the uh, geosgc simulation to match pretty well the geoschem simulation better. So um, when this is run, when the simulation is run for Mera2 and GSFP, they also use a simulation. So it doesn't matter as much that the go-kart aerosols aren't maybe accurate um, because for the meteorology, they then nudge the AOD, which is what is important. Um, and one other question, which is any reasons why you specifically focused on 2012, 2013? Uh, because it was a very polluted year, so uh, a very polluted winter. So the goal was, if, if we're looking for a good place to look at the um, this new model setup, uh, it's great to have a big signal. And a very big signal was the 2012-2013 winter. That's great. Thank you very much. So the next talk is from Ming Hao Xu from MIT. There we go. Uh, all right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Minghao Chu. I'm a PhD student at MIT. Today, I'll be going to talk about um, statistical and machine learning methods for correcting for meteorology when estimating policy impacts on air quality. This is joint work with uh, Noel Salin at MIT. Let me start with the motivating example. Uh, so I'm sure people have all seen some kind of picture like this. This is a satellite image over Europe on the tropospheric um, NO2 column concentrations. Uh, on the bottom of and of course you see large reduction to over a lot of those magazines and people have think some of this is due to emission changes due to the shocks, uh, external shocks of COVID-19. Um, so policymakers have been interested in attributing observed changes in air quality to emission changes due to either external shocks like COVID-19 in this case or emission policy in our pre-COVID uh, examples. However, this is not an easy task because not only your interested policy or shock influence emissions and then influence observed changes in air quality, but you also have uh, another confounding factor from meteorological variability. Therefore, researchers need to correctly correct for the meteorological variability in order to do this task. Looking at the what is the one used to correct for meteorological variability. Uh, 
uh, among the among the literature, uh, the multiple linear regression model or MR model is really the popular choice. A typical MOR model looks something like this. So this is a paper looking at impacts of C lockdown on air quality. On one side of the equation, you have the air quality, and on the other side, you have your interested policy or shocks of emission changes. And th in this case, this is the C lockdown. And the researcher are interested in measuring this causal parameter beta. Uh, researchers know there are meteorological impacts, so they will put in some linear combinations of meteorological variables, such as temperature or precipitation, hoping to correct for the meteorological variability. However, there is However, there's little investigation on how those uh, models uh, really work in terms of correcting for meteorological variability. Uh, in another word, the policy effects estimate with models like MOR are really seldomly evaluated against true policy effect. And uh, part of the reason is because getting counterfactual is intrinsically impossible. You can never know what the NO2 in 2020 in Europe it's like if the meteorology happens to be the 2019 case. So in this work, we simulate a counterfactual with a geoscan model, and we'll talk to that in the next slide. And we ask, how do the policy signals assessed with models like MR compare with the simulated counterfactual policy signals? And if those models doesn't really work, uh, what is the best available statistical approach, and what is the performance of that? In a nutshell, we find MLR and simple regression models do not perform well, and it could be actually sometimes worse than if you do not do any correction at all on meteorology. The best available approach we find is uh, a machine learning implemented with random forest using both local and synoptic uh, weather scale features, and that could significantly reduce the biases for uh, trend estimates for ozone and PM. However, those performance also differ uh, differ by type of pollutants and differ by region as well. So with our methods, uh, we use GeoScam to simulate two set of scenarios. So one set of scenarios uh, observe scenarios with the real emissions, uh, including year-to-year -year variability and the real meteorology, including year-to-year -year meteorological variability as well. We also simulate another set of scenarios we call counterfactual scenarios. This set of scenarios include year, still include real emissions, including year-to-year -year variability, but with constant meteorology that uh, does not have um, meteorological year-to-year -year variability. Then on the counterfactual scenario, we can simply calculate the real policy effects on our quality that is free of meteorological variability. And then we take a look at the observed scenarios, which have the meteorological variability, and we use all kinds of statistical methods to correct for meteorological variability. Um, that could estimate policy effects, and we will compare this estimate effects with the what we call real effects from the counterfactual scenarios. This case study we're focusing on will be is the seven-year trend in PM and ozone concentrations in the U.S. from 2011 to 2017. Uh, to be more uh, specific, what we do is we will fit the following model on the daily PM and ozone concentrations for each nested grid cell in in, in the U.S. Uh, we try to, the code parameter we're interested in is this beta term um, correspond to meteorologic corrected trend. Uh, we'll include a different kind of correction for meteorology. And what I'm showing is this is the MLR linear combination of uh, correction, but we'll also try different types of correction as well. The meteorological features are a set of standard features from marriage. Uh, very quickly in the end on the results. So what I'm showing here is the trend in ozone estimates uh, for the Midwest region in the U.S., the dots showing the regional average trend and the two bars showing 10th and 9th percentile. So what you see on the first row, this is the what we call the ground truth given by the GeoScam counterfactual scenarios. Again, this scenario does not have meteorological variability. So this is uh, what one would hope for is the meteorological corrective trend. However, if you do not perform any correction, then this estimates will be very far away from the graphs given by GeoScan. Uh, interestingly, 
interestingly, if you take a look at the linear case, then this is actually even worse. So you are even further away from the ground truth given by the GeoSCAN model. Uh, more uh, nonlinear and more flexible model can reduce the bias a little bit, but really the game changer is uh, when you use machine learning with synoptic pa pattern uh, features, which means that you also allow other locations in meteorology to influence the air quality in this location. Nationwide, the pattern is uh, more or less more likely more or less the same. Uh, if you do not do any adjustment, then more than 50% of the grid cell which has a bias in its trend of more than 115%, and this could be significantly reduced by the machine learning plus synoptic uh, pattern method. Uh, we have a slightly different story for PM in the case that if you do not perform any corrections, then you're not really far away from the corrected signal in the first place, uh, but you still gain some marginal improvements from uh, more advanced methods, but the gain is, um, it is, is, is somewhat marginal compared to the ozone case. In conclusion, we find that those MLR and simple regression methods do not perform well, at least in this case in the US, in estimating meteorology corrected trends, uh, a random forest model using both local and synoptic scale features uh, could significantly reduce the bias, but the bias actually still remains significant uh, even with the best available approaches. With that, I'd like to thank you and take your questions. Thank you very much, that's great. Um, so my question is, you've used um, random forest here. Have you looked at other techniques for, for this kind of thing? So, um, uh, neural nets or then things like boosted regression? Yes, uh, we have not tested uh, the other methods yet. Uh, that, that will probably be a part of the future plan. And when you say that you've looked at synoptic features, how have you included the difference between, what's the difference between local features and synoptic features? Sure, yeah, so for all the models, uh, so we first uh, include the local features, which is the meteorological features on the nested cell. And then we include um, the features that you, basically all over the US, but in a more closer resolution, just due to the computational burden for that. Okay, that's cool. Um, hold on. So the question from Danielle, how would change in the tropospheric ozone background affect the trends? that change might not have been captured in your geoschem simulations? Yes, uh, that's a great question. And I probably need to think a little more. I think in our baseline simulation, the only changing factor is the astrogenic emission changes. So that is probably fine. Uh, the only changing part is the astrogenic emission changes in the US. So that is probably fine. But the one would hope to apply such methods to the observational model uh, to the observational data, so and that changing in background also would be a factor that uh, we will probably need to consider a little more carefully later. That's great, thank you very much. And now we've got the last talk of the meeting, and this is coming from Lisa Fries from MIT. Okay. Hi everyone. Um, I'll just continue with the trend of people from Cambridge presenting. <laughs> um, I'm Lisa Fries. I'm also at MIT. I've been working on this project with uh, Guillaume Chaussier, Sab Eastam, and Noel Celine, and I'll be talking about um, some work we've been doing on looking at the impact of nuclear power plant shutdowns on air quality in the U.S. Um, so for a bit of background about why we were interested in looking at this specific scenario is that across the US there's been increasing nuclear power plant shutdowns, specifically due to um, natural gas being so inexpensive, as well as increasingly expired licenses. So what you're looking at here is the EIA's annual energy outlook. And you can see here in this brown down below that it's expected that a large number of nuclear um, power plants will be out of capacity by 2025 and the majority are expected to be retired by 2040. There has been some previous work looking at historical nuclear shutdowns. So um, in this case, there's a paper by Severnini um, looking at Tennessee had a large shutdown of its two nuclear power plants in the 1980s. 
and that's marked by these two lines here. Um, and so what they do is actually use similar to how um, Ming Hao was actually just talking about, they use regressions to look at um, the impact on air quality as well as coal use, which is shown in these black dots up here in the region. Um, and to bring this into a little bit more of an international perspective, uh, nuclear power plants in general have been retired a lot around the world recently, um, specifically because of the Fukushima disaster and kind of the aftermath of what that meant for support for nuclear power. And so there's an NBER working paper on Germany's um, increase in coal use and subsequent air quality related deaths due to nuclear phase outs from 2010 to 2017. So what you can see here is that there was a large increase um, in CO2 emissions, SO2 emissions and NOx emissions in both absolute and percent change values as they phased out um, nuclear and switched to coal and natural gas. And this was using a machine learning framework. And so what we had wanted to look at then sorry, um, was to try to think about what the air quality and greenhouse gas um, emission impacts of nuclear power plant shutdowns would be in the United States, given the pending thought that it will likely occur in the US as well. Um, and then secondly, we were trying to think of ways that we could use um, something like GS Chem to look at local background air quality conditions and what that would mean um, to the impact of these nuclear power plant shutdowns. So in order to do this, um, we took kind of a systems model approach um, where we it worked on creating what we call US EGO, which is uh, the United States energy grid optimization model. Um, and we take that output and we run it through GSCAN. So I'll walk you through what US EGO is um, a little bit. Uh, pretty much we have the physical infrastructure and cost of generation and the renewable capacity for every single uh, power plant in the United States. And then we have the electricity demand across a number of regions in the US. And this is all data from the EPA that's publicly available. We run that through a constrained hourly cost minimization. And the reason we do that is that's how energy grids generally run is through cost minimizations. Um, and then what we're able to do is implement some sort of emissions intensity or control measure. In this case, I remove all nuclear power plants, but there's multiple other potentials that you could do with um, kind of this emission intensity or control measure. And from that, we get hourly emissions data for the entire year uh, for every single individual power plant. And essentially what we do is we turn that into a HEMCO file and replace the NEI um, EGU emissions in GeosChem and run GeosChem. And so oops, what that allows us to do is to look at, for example, these two case scenarios. So up here, you're looking at the normal setup of the United States energy grid, where red is the nuclear power plants and um, other colors signifying different types of energy. Um, and then down here is the no nuclear scenario. And so what you see is actually a large contingent of the nuclear power plants are in the Northeast, Midwest, Southwest, and that's also where a lot of the coal is concentrated. And that's going to influ influence kind of what we see as far as the emissions in the next few slides. So just a little bit of background on the gas chem setup. We are using a nested North American grid um, and specifically focusing on tropospheric chemistry. And I won't go into too much detail, but down below you can see that I run four different simulations. The first three scenarios where I'm changing NOx and SO2 from the EGUs are mostly for evaluating the US ECO model to see if it's in line with what we would see in a normal scenario. And the second two are looking at the changes due to shutdowns. So I'm going to talk about this, but feel free to reach out to me if you're interested in hearing about the evaluation. So um, as far as the emissions changes, what you can see is that there's uh, large increases in NOx, SO2, and CO2 when we shut off the nuclear power plant. So we see 50% increases, or 45 to 50% increases in CO2, SO2, and NOx when we shut off the coal. 
Um, and then from natural gas, we have 25% in CO2 and 40% increases um, in NOx and negligible in SO2, which is understandable. Um, and so what I'm showing here, sorry, it's okay. What I'm showing here is uh, we can look at kind of what the HEMCO files show us. So this is the percent change between the two scenarios. And what you're seeing is these large percent increases up to 20% increases in these Northeast, Southeast, Midwest regions in both winter time and summertime for NOx and SO2. And of course, what that translates to is um, subsequent increases in PM 2.5 across um, these same regions um, with generally increases across the entire US, but most largely in the Northeast, Midwest, and Southeast. And then we also see um, changes in ozone due to these changes in NOx, but um, we use kind of the formaldehyde nitrate ratio to look at ozone regimes. And we can see that because this is VOC limited in this regime, um, that we actually end up getting decreases in ozone because of the increases in NOx in this area as well. And so just to bring this into a little bit more of the social side of things that we're trying to look at as well is to look at the health impacts and social cost of carbon as well as ability to meet Paris goals. And what we see is that um, just by looking at, for example, the social cost of carbon, Thanks. Um, we have uh, from anywhere from 7.7 .7 to $36.7 billion of the social cost of carbon, depending on what discount rate you're taking. Um, and so, yeah. <laughs> that is all. Thank you very much. Um, you, what's, the, what's the assumption about the balance between renewables and sort of hydrocarbon to generate electricity? So it seemed to be that all of the increase in energy generation came from coal and gas. Mm -hmm. And in some parts of the world, that would be seen as an unusual choice. <laughs> yeah, so it's just based off of cost. So whatever would be the least cost energy at that time of day um, is chosen in the optimization. Um, so we're just trying to keep it to the lowest cost. And so it just happens that in the current setup of the US energy grid that coal and natural gas end up changing. And, and if you were to move, if you were, if there was to be an increase in the amount of renewables, so that is that is that the sort of one of the uncertainties in this is that you, um, you know, if there was a massive increase in the renewables, because in the UK it is way cheaper to build new wind or solar or um, other renewables than it is to build a gas power plant now. Yeah, so that's actually, um, I think my slides disappeared at the end, but that's what down here in the conclusions, the one final point is that realistically, you would have other build out going on. And one of the main points is that if you are decreasing nuclear, then maybe you should be building out renewables alongside because otherwise coal and natural gas will be taking on that load. Cool, that's great. So we've now come to the end of the presentations. And I think what we'll do is now turn to Danielle to give us um, some words at the end of the meeting. Thank you, Matt. I really appreciate it. And uh, I wanna thank you and Eloise and Paul for pulling together this uh, pioneer of the meeting. Very, very impressive. And I wanna thank all the, all the speakers, uh, great talks, attendees. I look forward to the poster session that's that's uh, coming up. Um, and I think there's gonna be a lot of lessons learned about this uh, meeting, which is really the first of its kind. And uh, uh, Matt and uh, Eloise and Paul have circulated a feedback form. Please respond to it. Uh, that's gonna be very useful uh, to learn about what to do in the future. Um, Matt asked me specifically to talk about the plans for IGC-10. So that's our biannual, uh, meeting of uh, GeoSchem uh, users uh, that uh, has been taking place at Harvard, uh, so every two years. And uh, the, the current plan is to have it uh, May 
third to seventh during that week, uh, 2021, uh, and to have it in person at uh, Harvard. Of course, we can't tell what's going to happen between now and May, but May is sufficiently far away that we can be hopeful that we uh, will be able to meet in person. Um, if it's not possible to meet in person, I think we're going to will defer that meeting to 2022. Um, and the reason for that, I think, is, is very important uh, for those IGC meetings um, that uh, they be very interactive, that they have a big priority on networking and engagement um, because they provide the fodder for uh, developing uh, the model. Um, with that regard, let me say uh, a few words about the role of young scientists because there's many here in this meeting. Uh, who are PhDs and postdocs. And I would say you are really, or beginning assistant professors or whatever you call them in the UK, or lecturers or um, uh, uh, readers, if you begin by reading and then you lecture. Okay, anyway, um, young scientists are the foundation of GSCAN. They will always have been, and they're critically, critically important for a grassroots model like GSCAN, because you're the one who are developing the model, you're the one who are applying it, you're the one who are making it a better model for the service of a whole community. And um, in that regard, it's very important to have you at the, the International GSK meeting. It's very important to have you engaged. And I would say uh, also to the young scientist is that uh, you don't know how good you have it. I mean, this is a really ex exceptional opportunity that you have uh, during those formative years uh, to work with a model that has a very strong community backing in atmospheric chemistry. It's not a monster of a model, so you can actually work with it, modify it, and then your changes actually go into the standard model, and so you get recognized for it. You're interacting uh, with a community of senior scientists who are really committed to GeoSCAM. It's very important for us as a tool and as a result, we know you. We know who you are, what you do, and uh, this can be a big uh, stepping stone in, in your career. Uh, so um, I look forward to having you come to IGC 10 next year. Please, we hope, I hope we can. And um, I uh, look forward to having you uh, engage actively. Um, I realize I'm starting to talk a little bit too long, but that's always the case. I wanted to say a couple of words about what we're going to do in the meantime between now and IGC-10. We're going to continue on our road of model development uh, priorities. Um, and um, those model development priorities were outlined at IGC-9, and you can actually find them on the website, what we've done, what's still uh, to be done. I uh, really uh, would... Uh, appreciate and the whole steering committee would appreciate um, if you could review those model development priorities and uh, tell your working group chair uh, what you think is important or if you have new model developments uh, or just concerns about the model that you would like to see addressed uh, again that you communicate with your working group chair or you know with your advisor whatever um, so that we can bring them into the model development uh, priority streamline. Uh, I mean, we have a number of items on the scientific development agenda, in particular, uh, um, things like improved scavenging, improved VOC chemistry, um, and a number of other items. And we're always trying to catch up with the most recent emissions, and that's always um, interesting. Um, I'm most excited over the next year about expanding the capabilities of a model. Uh, so facilitating the use of GCHP, we heard about this. Uh, increasing the use of WARF GC, which I think is very mature and allows you to take GSCAM from the global to the urban scale and the capabilities of using GSCAM in, uh, in uh, earth system models. Uh, you know, GSCAM is really a well-oiled machine at this point and um, it's, uh, it's on a very steady and firm footing with a large community that's committed to it. Um, and I'm really looking forward uh, to the future, and, uh, and the future is you. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Danielle.